Welcome back to Kevin Pollack's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How the hell are you? How have you been? How is the new year treating you? These are the questions I need you to answer. And answer them by writing to me, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. What was that? Sure. KPCS, as in Kevin Pollack's Chat Show. KPCSfanmail at gmail.com. I'm going to read a couple of your letters here today. We are coming to you uh, not so live from the Earwolf Studios in uh, Hollywood, California. My guest today is uh, an award-winning filmmaker that um, I'm uh, very excited to talk to. Um, we're, uh, we're catching up on today's show. I'm using today's show as a way to catch up with an old pal as well as um, taking advantage of other uh, talents and, in, and interesting stories, which I'm excited to share with you in just a few moments. Uh, recent guest, you ask? All right, stop being so goddamn pushy. A week ago today, we had David Harbour, for those of you Stranger Things fans, sat here. And uh, that's a great episode that dropped yesterday. Check that out immediately. Uh, Greg Kinnear, Jennifer Tilly. Oh, love Jen. Christopher Guest, Lauren Graham. Oh, and of course, Ricky Gervais. We'll never stop talking about how we had Ricky Gervais on um, the day before my birthday, which was really exciting back at the end of October. Uh, upcoming guest, Pamela Adlon, Louis Anderson, just saw him at San Francisco Sketch Fest on the Baskets panel. He's so damn talented. Love Louis. He'll be up uh, very soon. And uh, before we get to your mail, um, I want to congratulate the entire cast and crew on the Amazon series that I'm working on called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Not only uh, the sweet Golden Globe, but we picked up the Critics' Choice Award as well for Best Comedy and also Rachel Brosna Brosnahan. That's not how you say her name. Usually you don't swallow in the middle of the last last <laughs> name. You just say it right through, Rachel Brosnahan. Uh, she picked up another award for Best Actress in a Comedy Series. It's so freaky to, uh, to first uh, be involved in a show that I would tell my friends to watch. That, that already hasn't happened in so long. I don't want to begin to, to tell you. Uh, it just – you know, we're I've I've talked about this a little bit on the show, but actors or, or, or any artists really, but actors and writers and, and directors. Now that I'm wearing uh, so many hats, and, and, you know, we're not allowed to just work for a living. Um, we we either judge or judge ourselves about working for money. Uh, we have to treat our careers like porcelain eggs. Uh, and um, uh, I found out. On a few occasions that it turns out it, it's not how the audience feels. The audience doesn't actually care what you do as long as they like it. You can judge yourself on whether or not you should be hosting a game show. But if the audience loves that game show, they don't give a shit. Sure, uh, a director working on a movie may think twice about hiring the guy from the game show. And that's why we treat our career so delicately. So it's been forever – since I uh, actually was involved in something where I was shoving my friends against the wall and saying, you have to see this, I promise you. Then uh, I, there, I'm told up and down about this Rotten Tomatoes thing, which I never checked before because I figured it would be bad news. So I never bothered with the Rotten Tomatoes. So now we're still uh, at 96% critics and audience, which is lunacy, um, I'm told. Again, uh, I have researched people and they tell me how important this shit is. Um, and, and then this award stuff, I, I, I've been in some very high profile projects. Three movies alone are in the AFI top 100, but never have any of them won a Golden Globe. So to sit there and see, uh, the show win, I, I, I'm just aghast and, um, I'll shut up about it now, but congrats to all the cast and crew for working on this show that thankfully people won't shut up about. We go back to work in March for season two, and uh, more to come on that, I'm just going to say, for now. Um, again, write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. A couple of your letters here. Good sir, this one starts from Thomas in North Carolina. I've always been a huge fan of Mr. Alda and his incredible body of work. Last week, I was revisiting Canadian Bacon. What an incredible ensemble. For the first time in about 20 years and seeing you and all on the screen made it click in my head that, hey, I should totally write in and make a formal request that you book him on the show. I know I'm not the only person who would love that. There's a got to be a metric fuck ton of us. 
That's a quote. The man is a national treasure. Please consider it. Thank you, Thomas, North Carolina. Yes, Thomas, I would love to have Alan Alda on the show. We've seen each other socially a few times since doing Canadian Bacon, John Candy's last film, and Michael Moore's only fiction uh, piece of work as a filmmaker. Um, although we could use a good war with Canada right about now. Uh, and I would love to book Alan Alda on the show. Do you have his number? Wait, my guest today is say me, me, I have his number. All right, so it's going to happen. Our guest today, now I know why I booked. Um, yes, that, look forward to Alan Alda on the show. I'm getting his number as I, as I speak. Uh, this next letter comes from Anthony Rome. Ke ask, uh, ask Kevin, you have talked about how your stand-up career taught you how to listen and interact with audiences on an emotional level and how you translated that skill to inform your acting. The chat show has obviously informed and been informed by this skill. You read the guests' energy and use little tricks to get them more comfortable, more engaged, etc. I want to know, how has your chat show informed or influenced your poker playing and vice versa? Also, just watched the Chuck Bryan episode and wanted to answer your question. Never stop telling relevant stories to your guests. I want KPCS for the KP as much as the guest. And I do not care if I've heard the story before. I believe that the guests' reactions to your stories and your voices are every bit as informative as their answers to questions about their careers. You might tell one story five times and get very different reactions as well as provoking different interactions. And if Alan Arkin's voice helps the guests relax so they can be more in the moment, that is what makes your interviews different and better. Well, Anthony Rome, look at you. You saw how insecure I was and how I beat myself up when I preface any story with, I've told this story a thousand times. Um, how insightful and wonderful of you, and thank you for all of that. Uh, and, and to answer your question, how has the chat show informed or influenced my poker playing? Well, um, it, yes. Uh, one of the best compliments I can get uh, hosting this show is I'm a good listener. So there's no question being an observer of human behavior uh, not only has informed the acting, uh, but it, it's wildly informative for the poker play. Yeah. Uh, it's about on any given hand, um, where am I? in this hand at this table? What is the, my position to the button? What is my position against my opponent? The best players I've, I've learned from and played with, I'm talking top tier pros, um, don't even have to look at their cards. That's what position and knowing your opponent is. Um, and their cards matter not. So although I'm not at that level, I, I try so desperately to study my opponent and watch their every move and, and yeah. I will be um, I will be informed uh, by my uh, other skills on the chat show as well. They feed each other, so th thank you for that, Anthony Rome. What a what a fine fellow. Let's get to our guest, shall we? I'll get the rest of your letters uh, soon. This last one's a quickie. Hello, I love the Kevin Pollock uh, chat show podcast. Very entertaining, informative. Can you tell me the name of the jazzy opening closing theme songs? I'd like to get a full version of that piece of music. The composer's name is Brian Tyler. He's an award-winning composer that's done giant, giant movies and uh, slummed uh, one day to play 11 instruments, I think, and and uh, write and record and produce that song for us. So thank you again, Brian Tyler. Thank you for reminding me. Our guest today. It's about time. Let's start with the only Paul Simon, with the Paul Simon classic. We know him as the only Jew boy at West Point. Um <laughs> The only boy in New York City. So, oh boy. Rod Lurie, ladies and Jews, please bring those paws together. Oh, Rod. Yes, sir. Um, now, uh, we have so many topics to cover. For, right. Like, uh, why am I even here? Yeah, this not, is going to be the lowest rated podcast you have ever you had. Can, you can take the headphones off completely if it makes you more comfortable. All and right. I say, why not? Um, so, in terms of, uh, first of all, thank you for assuming our ratings are ever high. That's very kind of you. My mother's going to listen to the podcast. Mm -hmm. My father, not so much. Yeah. So, um, folks in Los Angeles, where we're, we're coming uh, from today, may know you originally mm. as a voice on KABC. Right. You did a film review. I did that. I was also the film critic for Los Angeles Magazine. But yeah, right. and that got me this gig at, at KABC where I had my own film review show and interview show. And you and had guests on. All the time. Big the, the biggest, yeah. Big, mm -hmm. big, big. And mm -hmm. you got those guests because 
you started to become um, almost, well, dare I say, revered with your abilities to review intelligently, but also when it came to Oscar time, which mm -hmm. we're getting to soon, right? Um, campaign certain actors and actresses uh, I insisting that they would not only be nominated, but that they would win. That's right. Against the odds in many cases. That's or right. Certainly in most cases. That's right. And eventually those people won and then thanked you in their acceptance speech. Yeah, but 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 hold on. Yeah. So that, that was a bit of a gag also. Like the first guy that did that was Marty Landau. Yes. May you rest in peace. Yeah. A wonderful guy. And he came on to promote Ed Wood. And I said to him, I said, Marty, you know you're going to win the Oscar now. And he goes... I don't know that. I don't know that I'll even be nominated. And I told him, I'll make you a bet. If you win... You have to. You have to thank me. If you lose, I'm going to do a uh, uh, contribute an hour on the show to the Marty Landau Got Screwed Hour. And he said, you're on. Yeah. And he kept his word. Uh -huh. He won and he thanked me. But, you know, we relentlessly campaigned. Although I think he would have won and been nominated, you know. Oh, let's be clear. That. Your campaign had nothing to do and, with it. Not, nothing to do with that one. Yeah. Okay. But – and then I made the same deal with Mel Gibson. Right. With a brave heart. Right. And he thanked me. And then I made the same deal with James Cameron and Titanic, and that was by no means uh, a sure thing at the time because you know it was a, it hadn't even come out yet. It was a big, it was a big popcorn film. People were lining up to hate that film right. before it came out. Me too, by the way. Yeah, and uh, I was totally wrong. I loved it when it came out. And James Cameron thanked me. I got screwed by a couple of people who Promised. I made a deal with and and didn't. Billy Bob Thornton was one, uh -huh. and Anthony Minghella was the other. Right now. Billy Bob, I think that our show had a big influence on because they were ready to take it out of his theater in Santa Monica. And I got on the air and I said, I want every single listener of this show to go to that theater tonight to see Sling Blade. Right. And everyone went. Right. And the show did fantastic business and they, they kept it. I don't think they knew why it was – why the theater was packed. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it held over, and it right. just continued and continued, and we relentlessly pounded that movie, which I thought was an absolute work of art, and that performance was a work of art. Yeah. And um, and then uh, Billy Bob promised to make it up to me uh, after he didn't thank me. Uh, it was a gag, and you know, I don't really care about being thanked, but it was a shtick for the show. And he said if he won for a simple plan, which we all knew he wouldn't, he would thank me. <laughs> but one of these days, maybe he's going to win. He'll, he'll have to say retrospectively, 20 years ago I was supposed to have thanked right. uh, Rod Lurie, and I didn't, so thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago. But that was a lot of fun. Boy, that was a, that was a great time, you know, being on the radio and coming in and looking like a schlub and – it was a great. It was great for me. I oh, it was on Saturdays, and I would sit there, and I would also have the uh, football games on, the sure. Saturday college games on that I had to bet on every one of them, and I'm doing the show and watching that, and interviewing Tom Hanks or whomever came on. It was a good time. Yeah, a long time ago. What year was this? I began in '95, and I stopped in '99 mm -hmm. because I started making films, and it, it, it came to a point where. We made a film together, yes, Deterrence, and That's then. Right. Um, I, I, but I kept the radio show going on, and there started to be some uncomfortableness with reviewing a movie that maybe you were in, or that uh, Tim Hutton was in, or Sean Astin was in, and, friends of yours, or anything to do with Paramount. You know, there seemed to be a conflict of interest, and then I was going to start shooting a movie called The Contender, right? And now we had Jeff Bridges and Gary Oldman, and it just became so vast now right. that I had no credibility to be on the air at all without people first of all I, I would have protected my friends sure you know I'm sorry you know well I, you, William I, Goldman wrote in his very yeah. famous book you know the, the, the trappings mm -hmm. of wanting to support your friends right and wanting to vote or judge things with your actual feelings for, right for example the examples he gave was he would be invited to a screening an early screening by a friend who was a filmmaker and he found that after the film played, right. he, he would share his honest opinion. And it was – unless it was glowing, right. his, the, his friend, the filmmaker, was so crestfallen that he realized after a while all his friend wanted was love and support. Well, but, they right. actually didn't want input or, or criticism. Well, especially if the input means nothing. Right. I, if, I mean what I mean by that is if the film is locked – 
Right. You know, then... The well, no, these he, were not locked. Done? These were these were early versions of the film. Well, where then he's silly because he should be taking the... Not taking the criticism so much as taking the suggestions on how to improve his, no, his, his movie. No, he, he was talking about how filmmakers would ask him to attend a screening. And right. then they would ask him afterwards, what did you think well, of the film? So right. uh, his point was... He tried to be honest with them, right. with various filmmakers over and right. over again. He had the same response. He yeah. saw the look in their eyes. And they d revered his opinion right. so much that he found that it was too, too far too painful right. of an experience. And that's where terms like, well, it's all up there, came from. Yeah, I Looks know. like you guys had a lot of fun making I, that one. I had an agent who told me, he told me, you know, um, when I see a client's movie mm -hmm. or a friend's movie and I don't like it, I always say the same thing, mm -hmm. and that is, I say to him, "You did it again." Yeah, you did it again. It's the worst, right? So, so now his name, that, that agent's name was David Saunders. He was at APA, and anyway, I left APA. I joined William Morris, and then I made a movie called Resurrecting the Champ with Sam Jackson, and I still remain friendly with my my ex agent David. And I invited him to a screening, and after the movie was over, he turned to me and he said, "Oh, you did it again!" Oh and I go, God. "Oh, fuck." You know what? <laughs> Did he not realize he had told you, or he of was doing he, a he's joke? He's an agent, of course. He didn't realize, but he's a <laughs> lovely guy. And but and then we talked about what was wrong with the movie in his right. in his opinion. And you know, at that movie, the movie was semi locked, but I could still I could still get into it. And um, boy, you really have to have a thick skin in in this business if you want if you want to succeed. And well, yeah. So let's talk about the transition from because you know there are only a handful of reviewers I would ever ever care what they had to say right? because ultimately it is just one person's opinion. Right. So you get someone Absolutely. like Janet Maslin who wrote great essays right. on film mm -hmm. and filmmaking and storytelling and then that becomes a different art form. Yes. So obviously uh, uh, you, you were trying and your interests were in following in the, the footsteps of those, of those great film reviewers as mm -hmm. opposed to surely what exists now in the critic world, mm -hmm. which unfortunately has been blown wide open right. by bloggers. Yeah, everyone's a critic, as they say. Well, you know, it, the, the the joke that everyone's got an opinion and they all stink yeah. has been around forever. Right. Um, and a, a it was quite rare that a singular opinion could, could yeah. change anyone's right. mind. Mm -hmm. And as a performer all these years, right. an actor and writer, what have you, who's been, who has been critiqued um i if if the criticism is specific and helpful mm -hmm. um it's so rare right that it's celebrated for sure by right. me and w so often the case is simply not your cup of tea right this is not what absolutely what, correct yeah and if you can articulate mm -hmm. um a style of storytelling or the work of an artist an actor a filmmaker Right. And talk about their body of work or talk about what they accomplished or set out to and where they fell short and be specific. Mm -hmm. Then you're actually uh, taking on a completely different role. Right. And uh, and your stuff seemed to always be that. Yeah, it was, uh, you know. A I, student of. I, I really I really was. And I was sometimes too mean. I was trying to, I was trying to show off sometimes. Sometimes I was trying to show how clever I was rather than how clever the filmmaker was. And they all I, I are wasn't, guilty. Yeah, but I, I'm not, I wasn't that great a critic. I was influential and I was funny. Right. And, and I, I certainly was well listened to and, and well read, but I wasn't that good. You know, when I would read the writings of um, Pauline Kael or Roger Ebert, two of the best, or um, Manola Dargis, uh, who was on the LA Times, and um, I think either LA Weekly or San Francisco Weekly, you know, I realized how inferior uh, a, a critic I, I was. I, I just wasn't at that level, which is one of the reasons why I said, well, I'd always wanted to be a filmmaker, but now I really got to pursue it because maybe I'll, I'll be better at that. But I always saw that there are two kinds of critics. Mm -hmm. They're the kind of critics you read before a movie and the kind of critics you read after a movie. Mm. Like Paul and Kale, only worthwhile reading after you've seen the film. It, it, she so gets into the nuts and bolts of it, she goes under the hood of the movie and, right. and, really, and really examined it. Whereas Roger Ebert, who one of the greatest critics of all time, he was a guy that would either convince you to go to a movie or to, or to stay home. Right. And very often a movie I would not be interested in 
you know, I would end up going to go and see because of what Roger had right. to say about it. And he, you know, he was the the, the best non-spoilerish critic there was. Right. Um, That's an art form all to itself. That is. And, and, but Kale completely, it was spoiler central, but you sort of knew that going in. Right. You don't write a 4,000-word review and, and have it not go into the depths of, of, of the plot. Sure. Then there were critics who just like gave away endings of movies like Rex Reed would and has, and has done. Yeah. And, and I guess still does. I, I guess he's still being, being, being printed. And, um, but mostly as a critic, I just wanted to have – I wanted to have a good time, and if I really supported a film, you really knew it. And uh, and to me, it became almost like like a mission. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I still my home was filled with letters from actors and directors, you know, thanking me for their support. And and sometimes they'd be very disappointed that I didn't like a film. And sometimes they would they would be able to convince me. They changed my they changed my mind about a film. Right. Like. Um, Jerry Maguire, for example, is a film I didn't care for when I first saw it. Mm -hmm. Then I spent some time with Cameron Crowe and he was explaining to me his motivations. And I went and looked at the film and just realized that I, that I had missed many things. And maybe I hadn't watched it care carefully enough. Well, that, this is the interesting part about the, the task mm -hmm. of reviewing a film. Because I find if there are any expectations, right. you've tainted your opinion. Um, and if there, it, it, your demeanor, your mood, what you yeah. had for breakfast that morning, what happened the night before, right. all of our personalities are changed and are shifted to, at times, to mm -hmm. such degrees mm -hmm. that if it, you know, sometimes as an actor, um, a day's work can be undermined by my personal life. That's right. So the same thing would be true of any. I experienced that with you Professional. On, on the movie that we made together. We uh -huh. made a movie called Deterrence together. It was my yeah. first, my first film, and <clears throat> you know it's just a fantastic performance that you gave. But there were a couple of days where your mood was ruined. Right. I remember that. You know, I, I won't mention names here necessarily, but you know, there, there, I don't know if you remember this, but <laughs> there was once there there was a sort of an interpersonal conflict with one of the other performers in the film. Sure. And it affected your mood and you couldn't concentrate. Yeah. And you, do you remember what I'm talking about? I remember very greatly and I, I had never been um, mind-fucked before by a, by a, right. a co-star. Right. And I don't know that he was trying to mind-fuck you, but, but oh, he did. Oh, You think so? <laughs> there's, there's no there's – no, th that level of mind-fucking doesn't exist without effort and intent. Right. I mean – and I, I can assure well, you. So, a, so that's, yes. That's a whole other topic, you well, know, a yeah. whole other conversation about but actors. But I hadn't, I hadn't really experienced it before or since. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was – that was that was pretty intense. So so I we we will get to the part of filmmaking because I finally tip uh, my toe in the water a couple of years ago. Um, Directing and yeah and and, and um, poised to to go at it again in the fall. Um, the wonderful producer Julie Orn, you know Julie. Yeah, yeah of sure. course. Yeah, Academy Award nominated for Hell or High Water and so yeah, of great course. body of work. Astonishing. Of course, of course. Um, is she and going to produce your movie? She is, yeah. And we, we, we're just starting the casting process did, did, now. Uh, can you say anything more about it? Can you give the title or what it's um, like, the genre, uh, genre? It's um, it's an attempt at making the classic noir whodunit uh -huh. contemporary. Okay. Um, with a detective and a femme fatale and, and surprises and twists. Oh, great. Uh, and, and I'm very into filling plot holes. and Like a, like a modern-day uh, L.A. Confidential um, well, it's lines? contemporary set, right? So the music will be, you know, I got Jack White to give me a song for the opening titles of my last film. And it, the music will have a lot to do with, you know, as you know, with every film, mm -hmm. setting the tone and the mood. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I, not to draw many parallels to what Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels was mm -hmm. in comparison to what I want to do. But the way that that filmmaking style and music uh, put a new mm -hmm. uh, bent on a heist. Film. Right. Um, the movie yeah. was insane. Yeah. Guy Ritchie's movie. Yeah, of insane. course. Yeah. The idea is to contemporize it in such a way that 20-somethings yeah. and 30-somethings are introduced to what you and I would think to be yeah. a classic storytelling style. Right. So it'll be very stylistic, um, and I'm very excited about it. It's been around for quite a while, and it's been funded 
uh, and fallen apart maybe four or five times. Yeah, welcome to welcome to yeah, the world. That's yeah, that's what the that life is. I'm in going fact, through that now. This script yeah. was originally greenlit at Focus Features. It was only the second place my then agent sent it out. What, to. Is it you? You wrote the script? Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. And uh, it was only the second place he sent it to. They greenlit it without notes. And two weeks into the casting process, the president is fired, and the new person comes in and flushes everything oh, down the toilet. God. And by the way, God. I don't think you should Every... be able to join the DGA unless that's happened to you. Yeah. Oh, my God. Right? I mean, so many times. Every time. Every filmmaker I've ever mentioned that to goes through exactly what you just went through, and then they share a story of what's happened to them. Well, So yeah. it's just part and parcel of, right, of, of course. the gig. Um, yeah. so, so, which is also the reason I don't believe this is going to happen in the fall <laughs> until it happens in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, but all signs point to yes, we're funded, and or uh, so on and so forth. Wait, so, so are you going to be in it? No, no. I I learned on the last one when they wanted me to be in it that by saying no, I freed myself up to really um, uh, cast up by getting mm -hmm. J.K. Simmons in the role they wanted me to play right. six months after he won the Oscar and everything else. <laughs> um, but also just uh, a, a focus solely on to me a task at hand that needs a hundred percent of the, and of your that's attention. the main lesson you learn from the the first film. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And also, um, I put it off forever, and I, I, I was intimidated by the responsibility. You know, we've mm -hmm. had a lot of filmmakers on the show. You keep asking why you're here. I'm, I'm fascinated by the process, which we're right. going to get into, because um, much like everyone's career trajectory, which is also unique to each person, mm -hmm. the style of filmmaking and the temperament of filmmaking and the joy or sorrows or frustrations of filmmaking also comes down to our unique personalities. And I felt more as a stand-up comedian, I had built all these instincts, you know. Um, the first film I directed was a documentary, a Talking Heads, really. Uh, that, but it premiered at Sundance. It had a nice run. Mm -hmm. But it talked about, the thesis was, you have to be miserable to be funny. It's called right. Misery Loves Comedy. That's and, right. and it, it, um, it afforded me an opportunity to have real conversations, which mm -hmm. I do on this show, but then get into an editing bay on my own and try to cut without a script or a storyline, mm -hmm. just these interviews. Um, and so I learned a lot about the editing processes and the nuances of that. Mm -hmm. And so all the things that we do inform the next thing we do, right? Right. So um, before we move on to the filmmaking, which I, I, I'm most fascinated with, I want to do a, 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 a bit of a, um, I guess, cheap trick, which is okay. to talk <laughs> a little bit about your Academy Award uh, nominations. Because you – as we touched on a little bit, you kind of became um, one of the few voices, certainly in Los Angeles. Right. I don't know how far stretching KABC was. Not very far. Right. To Los Angeles. Right. Uh, it's a local show. But it got a lot of attention. Because right. those back in the days where – Reviewers' names would get put onto posters on the right. one sheet if they gave a certain opinion, and some of those reviewers became soft sells just to get on one. That's sheets, right. Which became its but own that's crime. That's a yeah. They were called quote horse. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, rightfully so. Right. So um, ha you've seen you say almost everything before this we went year. On yes. Mike. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about who uh, should win and who will win. Or who should get nominated and who will get nominated, whatever you're comfortable talking about. Let's start with um, Best Supporting Actor. Now, so far, uh, my pal Sam Rockwell mm -hmm. has, has picked up most of the uh, raves. And, he's, and picked up, he's, of picked the up, he's picked up the uh, two televised awards, but Willem Dafoe has won almost every single critics award. Okay. And, you know, I thought that they're both – in the Florida Project, mm -hmm. and uh, and you think and Willem Dafoe three. is a true supporting actor role, or is it? No, one I, that, I don't, and right. that and that's and that's I think the issue there um, is that he really he really isn't. It's to me he's certainly the male lead of the film, although you know the the two the very young girl uh, Brooklyn I think her name is she's six years old Brooklyn Prince I think and the um, and the woman who plays her mother whose name I, I forget and I'm so sorry because she was really wonderful in the film they're the true leads of the film but he's really the anchor of the of the movie and he's and he's quite and he's quite great um, I, I I'm not sure I quite understand why the praise was so it it, it was like so much praise, like the blood coming out of the elevator in uh, The Shining, it just it just kept coming and coming and coming, and and it's a really good performance. It's uh, rather wonderful, and I guess there was one bravura moment in it where he. Have you seen the film? Which praise? 
the price for Defoe. Okay. Have you have you seen the Florida Project? Well, there there is a scene where he confronts a what do we think is a child molester. That's a semi a semi bravura scene. But I kept waiting for that incredible moment where he said that's the Oscar moment, and it it never came for me. Although he's a brilliant actor and he's brilliant in the film. Of course. Rockwell, Sam Rockwell. Um. That performance. Have you seen that movie? Yes. It's astonishing. It's it, it's 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 astonishing. And fearless. I, I also think it's a lead role. Yeah. Though to it, you know, to a certain degree. Well, it's got I, a lot of screen time in that. A lot movie. of screen time, but it's it it couldn't. He's not the male lead by by a stretch. The way that Defoe, I believe, is in. Okay. Well, at, at any rate, at any rate, he's he's more. Yeah. It, it's it, it's a beautifully. It's an amazingly. Uh, Written role, and you can you can debate the arc of the character. Mm -hmm. I would think in, sure. in that in that in that movie, but he's so eminently watchable, and what he does with his body physically through the film, the way that he carries himself, it's um, it's sublime, and it's yeah. and it's and it's perfection, and it's um, and he's evil, but you see what a damaged human being he he is. Yeah. And there's one of that, the more soulful actors we've ever had. Sam is Sam Rockwell is a um, he's an, an absolute master. Yeah. He's one of he's one he's one of our great actors, and I would as I would guess right now that he's probably going to uh, going to win the Academy Award. I, I think rather than uh, I think what I'd, I'd like to do. Uh, Rather than do who should win and who will win, is tell you who I don't think is going to get nominated but should. Oh, okay. And that is uh, Ben Mendelsohn in the in Darkest Hour, the movie by Churchill, starring Gary Oldman. I love Ben Mendelsohn. I've not seen the film yet either. Ben well, Mendelsohn. you saw him probably in um, in Bloodline. Is probably the I saw him in that, but I saw him in Animal first, the Australian right. film, where so, he gave one of the darkest, most intense, most right. compelling performances I've ever seen in my lifetime. And he so beautifully plays Animal Kingdom. I Animal called, Kingdom. He yeah. so beautifully plays the King of England mm. with that slight Stutter. speech impediment, yeah. and it's uh, it's such an elegant and beautiful, and uh, and I, I dare say soulful performance, and so completely outside of Bloodline or Animal Kingdom mm. that it, you know it, because it, of the um, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. But he's it's just. Not in the cards, and it's it's not that is not going to happen. That's great to hear you because know. I he's by far one of my favorite actors of the last ten years. I, I really you know I did a I did a pilot uh, last year that unfortunately didn't go. It's the uh, the torture of my soul that I didn't go called Monsters of God, and he was somebody who I wanted to have in it initially, and um, you know we couldn't even get past the the point of. Uh, Asking he was, because he was doing was, Star he, Wars he or something. Was, not, yeah, he's doing Star Wars or one of those. Yeah. Not not, a, not available. So, right. uh, un, unfortunately, he's he's one of those guys that can't sell a ticket, but every director wants to work with. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's one of those guys. You know, it's uh, which weirdly might be Sam Rockwell as well. Sam Rockwell, everybody wants to work with, and yeah. he's a guy. Should be that's, a household name. Should be. Underappreciated, perhaps, but you know, we we were both infatuated with Jeff Bridges. He's still my favorite actor of all time. Yeah, and you know, you go into these conversations with these foreign rights salespeople, and you right. and you have these conversations about funding movies for mm -hmm. the last fifteen, twenty, or more years. Right, and they all want pre-sales, and they all have a list That's of right. names that sell for a certain percentage. It's and I'm sure when you did Contender, the people with the money, they heard Jeff. Oh, I love Jeff Bridges, but. He's he's only right. worth X. That's right. We, and it's debilitating. It's, right. We um, when when I guess we'll go back to the Oscars in a second. But I wrote the contender for Joan Allen, mm -hmm. and when Joan agreed to do it, I thought I was in like Flynn. And then I realized that nobody would make a movie just based on Joan, right. no matter how good she is. Another one of those actors. And so then I went and I got Jeff, and they said, "Great." Who else are you going to get? Who else you got? Yeah. And it wasn't until we cast Gary Oldman that we made that we piled up just yeah. enough to right. to get in. Gary, by the way. Is if you want to talk about this year's Oscars, he's well. The other thing astonishing the about the contender, yeah, Joan and Jeff were mm -hmm. both nominated for Oscars. That's right, under your guidance and direction. Right. Thank you. Uh, Gary was not. Gary was not. He's those three performances. Yeah, um, are astonishing, and and in Gary's case, uh, way outside the box. You know, he's a chameleon right. to, the, to to such a degree. I think right. that it undermines his so-called box office draw. Mm -hmm. But his performance in The Contender 
is a clinic. Yeah. He it's was – when clinic. when he showed up on, on set, Kevin, for the first time, g- g- that was really a, a creature of Gary. That, that c- character's name was Shelley Runyon. And uh, you by know, creature I, you mean a creation? A creation. You had of written his. it, of course. I had written it, but, but but what he brought was not what you had in mind. It, it was so it, original. It was so original. I don't want to say it's not. I didn't really have. When you cast Gary, it's best for you not to have anything in mind. Yeah. Because he will he will bring his his own thing. And when he showed up on set, somebody came to me and said, "There's a guy on set that says he's Gary Oldman, but it's not Gary Oldman. It's a nut of some kind." And but he won't leave. And I got there, and it was Gary, in fact. But Gary had plucked out his hairs, literally, and and had transformed himself physically into this guy that looked like Arlen Specter. Wait and a minute, that was not a bald cap. No, that was he. He did that to his own hair. He did, yeah. See, I never knew that. No, I assumed it was no, makeup he did it. because it was so absurd. No, it was amazing. And he came with these glasses and he had this – and it perfected this Chicagoan accent. And it was um, – sometimes when – really with all three of those actors and Kristen Slater too actually and Sam Elliott, um, he um, – I, I, There's still a moment by the way yeah. that I show of Jeff Bridges. Yeah. Um, that is the single most human moment I've ever seen in fiction or reality. Okay. That the president of the United States had. When he screams has out. Had. Yeah. Nope. Joan Allen uh, goes to visit him in the single lane bowling alley of. <laughs> and he sniffs his shoe. And he sniffs his shoe. So he said, "You know what we should do." I should sniff my shoe because people do that. So, so he was in yeah. his bowling shoes, yes, and he was That's changing right. out of his bowling shoes them. into his own life shoes, mm-hmm. and he's in conversation, full blown. It right. is such a uh, tiny, t- tiny, t- tiny, t- minuscule gesture yeah. that as he's speaking and he's taking off his shoe before, right? He starts to put on his real yeah. shoe, and then he stops for a moment. But he's looking at her, and he's talking to her, and he smells his shoe, and then he puts it on and ties right. it. Still talking to her the whole time. Right. It's the tiniest, most specific decision yeah. as an actor um, that has stayed with me, and I scream yeah. about. Uh, yeah, it, it's brilliant, and I'll tell you, it was so ca- calculated. Uh-huh. He asked me ahead of time, "Can I do that?" And I said. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, you're Jeff Bridges. You do what you want. Yep. You know, you do what you – you go where your instincts tell you to go. And um, – World-class performance, one of the greatest performances of a president. And if I may, you might have a little bit of thank you to me for him agreeing to do the part. Okay. As I recall, Explain. he was invited to a screening of deterrence and he certainly said this to me. Yeah. And I thought you had said it to me afterwards right. as well. Or you might have just been complimentary. Yeah. But um, he he was excited mm-hmm. about the script, mm-hmm. unclear about you as a director because right. you had a very small body of work, which was a short film and then determined. Right. Um, four second delay? Yep. Is the name of the short? Um, and that it was uh, the performance you got out of me in deterrence – that relaxed his sphincter. Yeah, because he had seen you in other movies. That's and said, right. <laughs> This guy's no good. Well, um, w- when I went to see Jeff, yeah. this was uh, before the screening of Deterrence. When I went to see Jeff, because- In Santa Barbara? In, Sa- in Santa Barbara. I go to his house and he answers, it's 10 in the morning, and he answers the door in his big Lebowski outfit. Sure. Now, I don't mean- Kevin, I don't mean a big Lebowski-like outfit. I mean the big Lebowski outfit. He was in this costume. and he Because he was to, shooting? No. He oh. said to me, I know what you're thinking. Lebowski was wearing my clothes, not the other way around. This wow. is what I wear. Cool. And he says to me, you've seen Lebowski? Of course. Fan? Uh-huh. He says to me, do you want something to drink? So as a joke, I say, white Russians. Now, I don't drink like at all. No. I, last time I had a drink was on my bris. Right. And the when the rabbi gave it to right. me, and forced and, and, your and, vodka. Yes, and he says to me, "A wonderful idea." So Jeff comes out with six white Russians oh. and two croissants, <laughs> and over the next two hours, he consumes all six of the white Russians, and he's loaded. Sure. And he walks me to my car, and he puts his arm around me, and he says, 
the president, the 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 dude as president. Who'd have ever thunk it? <laughs> and, <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, and then you know he he wanted to do two things. One is to ensure that Joan Allen was in the movie. Right. He had done a movie called Tucker with her. Oh yeah. And then course. he wanted um, to see uh, Deterrence, which had not been which had not been uh, which right. had not been released yet. Yeah. Right. So all right, so let's go back to um, the Oscars. So 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 Sam Rockwell yeah. or Willem Dafoe, and then we go to a supporting actress. Another one that seems to be mm-hmm. between Laurie Metcalf and Allison Janney, who um, Allison's picked up the the trophies, but Laurie's been singled out by a great many critic associations, right. including Los Angeles Film Association, right. I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, Los Angeles Film Critics. That's right. Yeah. Um, so what are your what's your- well I would uh, you, you know they're both really absolutely stellar performances and Allison managed to do a role that would have been a caricature by many other people and infused it with um, with a realness that um, you know requires an actor of her skill um, I think that if I had to uh, flip the coin I would hope that it might land on the on Laurie's side mm-hmm. Laurie uh, Metcalf for one thing in my opinion has not had had enough kudos for her amazing career. Mm-hmm. I think she gave one of the great performances I've ever seen. Um, uh, first of all, in the uh, in the Roseanne show, mm-hmm. and um, then she did a movie called Mistress, uh, which was with Robert De Niro, which is a film about and Marty Landau, which she was just so magnificent in that movie. And I remember when I was a critic, I gave her my Best Supporting Actress award for that year. And I think that. People, they they both play mothers, mm. um, damaged, damaged, very damaged mothers. But the mother in in um, I Tanya. Well, but the, but yes, but the mother, but the mother in Lady Bird is a mother who really loves her daughter right. and is torn between, you know, rules and boundaries, rules and boundaries, but also is torn b- between their. Their physical distress and how that affects raising a child, and you see this beautiful thing that Greta Gerwig wrote, which is when they go on their tour of the Sunday tour of the homes that are for sale, and you can see what their relationship could have been had it not been eviscerated by the economic turmoil in their lives. And she's really wonderful in it. And boy, that scene where she drops her off at the airport and just is cold to her, and has that regret of being cold to her, it's just heartbreaking. So I think she. She was amazing. The other uh, young actor who's not going to get nominated is the little girl from um, the Florida Project, which you must see. It's it's a really um, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty amazing right. amazing movie. I, I think it could have been reshaped a little bit to be like a perfect film, and it's one of the best little kid performances I've ever seen. And obviously, somebody with no experience whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But I think it's the best performance by somebody under the age of 10 I've seen since Justin Henry and Kramer versus Kramer. Holy crap. And it's, it's, really, it's really something. But I think that's more instinct than skill at this point, obviously. And so – and she'll have her opportunities. But uh, that's – I guess that's the way that I feel for the time. That is the other bizarre thing about Ben Mendelsohn, by the way. He was a child actor. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was a very successful child actor in really? Aus- Australia, okay. which can be a curse. Right. Um, okay, so after Best Supporting, yeah, we jump to, uh, I don't want to go through all the biggies like Best Original Screenplay and Best Screenplay, but mm-hmm. um, maybe, maybe we do that when we just talk about, instead of breaking them into original and adaptations yeah. of the particular script. The Best Screenplay is Lady Bird, mm-hmm. you know, to, in, in, in my mind. Th- this year, right? It was um, it, it was such a fresh take on on a family relationship, which is the, in itself one of the hardest things to accomplish. It is because it, we feel we've mm-hmm. seen every take on a on a well, and, and I'll tell you, family. Uh, and I tell you, it's the best take on a family that I've seen since Terms of Endearment, which is one of the most beautiful screenplays I think I think ever ever written and one of the most honest and although you know I'm not a mom um, I do have a daughter and I do have a daughter who like Lady Bird 
loves herself, but you know has some has some fragility as, as well. And the pain of seeing your child in pain, or the pain of wanting to see your child succeed, where she may or she may not, is very alive alive to me. And Lady Bird reminded me of my of, sure. of, of my of my daughter, who's a, like a really skilled, wonderful, lovely um, person, human human being. But I. I thought that the presentation of it in that film through both the dialogue and the story and the capturing of, of pain within families was absolutely ex- exquisite. Greta Gerwig did a wonderful job directing it, but the, um, it, it is the script that is the shining star right. of, of that film. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I have no dispute whatsoever yeah. on, on that selection. So let's go to... Um, Stay with the biggies now. Best actor and best actress. Best uh, be- buddy, be- Gary Oldman. Be- that's a done deal. Yeah, it's a done deal, and it's and it deserves to be. So go to Vegas where you can get some some odds. Well, you cannot bet on the Oscars in Vegas, but you can bet on some of those online things. Right. And where I've always made a killing, yeah. and especially in categories where nobody knows what they're talking about, and the mm-hmm. odds go totally in your favor, like the best foreign language film. But Gary is is a lock, in my opinion, is a lock to win. Right. Okay. And and he and he deserves to win. The you know um, you know I'm a bit of a of a World War II scholar and a scholar on Churchill, and well, I'm not a scholar, but. Uh, that's studied. They, I, I've studied. That's completely the most arrogant thing I possibly could have said. But um, I have studied him as much as I possibly can, and he is literally perfect. Yeah, perfect in this. And um, the and also, by the way, his hair and makeup people that should be a done deal as well because that's completely prosthetic. And. You know, but he got Churchill's walk. He got how he stood. He got how he he got how he breathed, which was which was really interesting. Breathing is a very important part of capturing a person's of essence. Yeah. Um, I learned that when I, I shot a, a movie for National Geographic called Killing Reagan, and Tim Matheson did a perfect job as Reagan because he knew how he breathed when he spoke. Yeah. And Gary Oldman does the same thing as as Churchill. And we've had another great Churchill performance this year. That was John Lithgow in The course, Crown. With all respect to the great John Lithgow, not in the same planet, in, in, my, in my opinion. Well, a lot of that has to do, of course, with the amount of, of script. Yes, it does, of course. You but, know, you know, it's like— One, one is a, right. a, a, a much smaller supporting role in a giant television show that is not about your character. Well, Gary, you know, it's interesting. It's, you know, Gary has this unique ability to completely chew up a role like a, a bulldog with, uh, you know, with a bone. And yet yeah. it remains completely grounded and real. There, There is a scene. Between- I would argue that in The Professional, when he cracks open a capsule. Oh yeah, and, tw- and twists his neck right. and screams up into the sky. Everybody that he's not grounded at all. <laughs> no, that's true. But I think that. <laughs> so my point is, he can be brilliant and no, but compelling I I, and right, breathtaking right. while being arch as well. Yes, but th- but that movie called for that. That was a movie. Even the camera moves called for that sure. that kind of performance. And I don't. I think that may that may even been a joke take that uh, Luc Besson decided to to use. I've heard that that rumor before. But that movie was intended to be large and over the top, and there was nothing yeah, calm about that film. Of course. There is a scene in, the, in Darkest Hour where um, Ben Mendelsohn as the king comes to Winston Churchill's bedroom or living room, I forget which one it is, to have a talk with him and to tell him that he's going to support him on his decision whether or not he's going to cut a deal with Hitler. And it's such a beautiful performance by both of them. And you see um, Winston Churchill's a sort of an inner frailty that he was willing to expose to the king. And only the king. And only the king. Right. And that moment where he, he said, I'm going to support you. And how Gary, as Winston, turns to him and acknowledges the, the beauty of that sentiment and the assuredness that it gave him is it's it's exquisite and you know look i've worked with gary and we're and we're friends and uh, i just exchanged emails with him today and i obviously um you know i'm rooting for him a hundred a hundred percent as a friend but 
always a, also as a, as a fan. You mm-hmm. know, it's it, it is really a thing this performance, and I think it's the maybe the best performance of its kind since, ironically, since Helen Mirren played the Queen. You know, it may be one of the great performances ever given of a real life historical figure. Oh wow! Who has been portrayed many times, man, never as well as this. Right. So he's going to win. Right. And he may win by a larger margin than anybody ever has since <laughs> Helen Mirren as <laughs> Which the Queen. We'll never know. Yeah, there, there, there's this other kid, um, the kid from um, Call Me by My Name, or Call Me by Your Name, um, who everybody was raving about, who gives a very beautiful performance, but. The craftsmanship that that Gary gives is... I'm surprised Richard Jenkins, by the way, I just realized, um, isn't getting more attention. Well, he's going to be nominated. Shape of Water. He's going to be nominated. Has to be, right? Yeah. I would would think so. Uh, You know, really another... Back to best supporting, but still. Yeah, but it's 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 a really... It's a, it's a it's a beautiful performance, and he has that great scene where he comes on to that guy oh, in, sure. in, in the diner, and and you see his there are layers to his performance. The confident the, the the confidence to shame that arc that takes place in that one scene right. is is also a clinic in acting, and he's he's brilliant, and probably will be nominated again for a shape of water and may win again in the future but th- this year it's I think it's Sam Rockwell's year and let's go to best actress best actress to me is the is the biggest debate I it's it looks like it's going to be Frances McDormand based on everything that she's won so far and it's a role that looks almost as if it was written to win the Academy Award this unbelievable ball buster and she's got such fantastic lines and she curses a lot and and she also has those moments where she slips into a into into a humanity that you don't really see coming which Woody Harrelson does as well he's beautiful man. well that that scene between she and Woody Harrelson after he has been um, after she hears about his heart attack is you know where, where she goes back to the human being that she she was before maybe her daughter was raped and killed is is fantastic um, but if she has a threat it's from Saoirse Ronan who again is in this exquisite movie Lady Bird mm-hmm. and titular uh, character phenomenal she's 25 she's playing a teenager and that's a big you know that's a big age difference you know when you're 17 to 25 it's especially you know, how, uh, the maturity arc of women in general well that's what i mean and yeah. you know you know she knows how to carry her body right. she knows to hunch a little bit she knows how to yeah. you know she She's plays a a, she plays a character that's confident but still has the lack of confidence that that many that many teenagers have and the way that she sometimes shrinks in front of her mom is it's it's pretty beautiful i, I it's going to be hard to overcome francis's performance but you know personally i i think that's the that's uh, one of the achievements I think of Francis's yeah. performance is that her character on paper yeah. is has no redeeming quality whatsoever. Right. You have no reason to root for her. Mm-hmm. She's beyond rude and horrible. Right. And as it turns out, homicidal. Right. Um, but the McDonough work here yeah. is uh, the directing work. You mean? Yeah. It's it's and writing. It's mm-hmm. truly phenomenal. Yes. Um, and. Uh, I saw a play of his on Broadway, The Behanding in Spokane, with Sam Rockwell, right. Anthony Mackie, and Christopher Walken, who was doing his own play that was right. technically separate from the one I was watching, right. but mesmerizing in every possible regard. Do you remember any of the lines? Regard. As said by Christopher Walken. <laughs> no, but we, we we went backstage, Jamie and I, into his dressing room and sat for a little bit while he was taking off his makeup. Did, did you talk to him as Christopher Walken? Well, he knows all about it. So when the yeah. person knows he's about pro- it, right, you don't really do it to them unless right. they request it. He's probably the most imitated actor there is, right? Yeah. Everyone I mean, has I, some version of it. I have, I've spoken on the show. There again, I have to go back to Anthony Rome's encouragement. I've spoken on the show before that I have the single queerest brag of anyone you'll ever hear. And what that is, is a that? politically correct correct use of the term. If you Google Christopher Walken impersonation, sometimes, uh, Sam, I'll ask you to do that now if you don't mind. Google Christopher Walken impersonation. Over 100,000 search answers. Oh, my God. Can, will come up on any given day. And you're the first. I'm number one. Yeah. That, that in, <laughs> by the way, that in $7 will get me a coffee at Starbucks. Right. Um, and I guess Spacey number two? 
Uh, probably not now as much, yeah. although, although he might have skyrocketed because of the controversy and, right. and that he was finally proven to be Kaiser Soze. How many search answers? Do they, does that number show? It's, 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 uh, excuse me, 44,000. Only 44,000 today. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been 60, it's been 100. Right. It's been, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, so who's number one? one? There's a video of you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, my um, God. So, by the way, it'll perpetuate itself the more I get people I get to look it up. Um, but but so anyways, when, when that happens, right. you cross over into don't do it in front of the person because it's right. a parlor trick. Right. If he's not here, then my version of him is going to conjure up all the love you have for the actual person, which I right. will steal. Then if the actual person's in the room, I'm just a monkey. Right. Right. Yes. That's the only person true. who wants me to do it these days is Alan Arkin. Who uh, have you noticed? I don't stammer as much when I talk. <laughs> yeah. I I heard the impression. I heard the stammer. I didn't care for it. So and you you called him up on the Larry King now show. Now I don't right? do it. That's right. Of course. Oh, that's those are um, classic moments. Uh, okay, so now let's get to best director. I, best director. The best director is really interesting award. Um, I think that in uh, in this decade at least that the best director award has gone to the most innovative director mm -hmm. is what it's gone to. And it often does not correlate with best picture. Mm -hmm. That's why it's true. Yeah, that's why the Revenant will win best director, but Spotlight wins best picture. Or why um La La Land wins best director and Moonlight wins best picture. Or that um Gravity wins best director but um, uh, 12 Years a Slave wins Best Picture. It's the more actor, character-driven films that win the picture awards because of the um, – so many actors are in the Academy. Um, whereas for the Director Award, it's, it's really innovation. If you look at Birdman, and which did win Best Picture, you look at Birdman, The Revenant, those, um, Gravity, um, those films uh, are, are all like feats of directing craftsmanship that – uh, are sort of unparalleled. All of this leads to your argument that Christopher Nolan should get more love than he has so far during the awards I think that the, the, award the, the two directors that are going to be competing for that award are uh, the one Del, you, Del Toro and, yeah. and Nolan. And Del Toro's movie, Shape of Water... Speaks to every point you just made. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Although I would say that he showed that same skill and artfulness in Pan's Labyrinth. Whereas... Dunkirk, when I watched that film and the immersiveness of, of that film and the use of the IMAX in that film, you know, I, I could not have been more humbled as a, as a filmmaker than he when I saw that He is on a different film. level. But that's the thing. It's apples and oranges because I feel Guillermo has been on a different level. But here's the thing. Every time it's Apples played. and oranges are both fruits. They're both round. They both have skin. But I love they're, oranges, they're, and I'm not that crazy about apples. You see, but they're they're, they're comparable. Though. <laughs> they are. Yes. I if you go by what's been happening recently, then it looks like Del Toro has got the uh, the upper hand, and um, and Dunkirk does seem to have slipped away uh, a little bit. But it wouldn't at all surprise me. I do think that Dunkirk will be will have more Oscars than any other movie by the end of the night, because of the technical awards. Mm -hmm. Like in in all likelihood, although I think that probably no film will make more than have more than five Oscars this year. Uh, that's an interesting call right there. I have to represent Jamie, who's not here, uh, in terms of Dunkirk. Uh, while we both enjoyed the film, mm -hmm. she was quick to point out afterwards to my uh, laughter and enjoyment yeah. that they won't win. I don't think they'll win sound editing because for some reason Christopher Nolan has this. Boom, yeah, right. It's a, right. all the way through the film, and right, it's that's a, like a, someone fell asleep on a button. <laughs> well, he actually has a, a, I think, a ticking clock in this one, and that that's as much Hans Zimmer as uh, as as anything else. I was just so blown away by it, and I think that it should win the cinematography award. Although maybe this will be the year that Roger Deakins gets it after like uh, two dozen tries. Right. I mean, I do remember walking out of Dunkirk thinking. This is the most – this will be the most masterful filmmaking mm -hmm. of the year. I could yes. see where people will be very turned off by um, the storytelling That's right. or the entertainment value. Right. But in terms of masterful filmmaking, well, you know what he is? I don't know how to do this He's better. Kubrick. He's like Kubrick. Right. You know, Kubrick – Well, Kubrick never made a film to entertain ever. Right. Well, you know, he, he made a film to entertain his own needs and desires. But in terms of entertaining, I mean commercial value. He never clearly gave a fuck about that. Well, and 
2001 A Space Odyssey, many people think it's the best movie ever made. And it, but it's, it has no emotion. Right. And Dunkirk is not, does not have emotion either. Right. It's filmmaking. You know, Kevin, when you listen to, this is not a, an original thought. When you listen to Mozart, mm. you learn about humanity. When you listen to Beethoven, you learn about Beethoven. Okay, and the same can apply to filmmaking. When you watch a Spielberg film, you learn about humanity. Right. When you watch a film, film by Kubrick, you learn about Kubrick. And I think that that applies to to Dunkirk as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very much the vision of of a man, and you're inside of his brain, and uh, which apparently has a right. That's right. Can you imagine having to sleep through that? <laughs> and um, when you look at something like The Shape of Water, though, it is a bit of a mix, isn't it? I mean, it's a it's a very emotional film. Oh my! And is it's it? really it's really beautiful. By the way, um, maybe if she's nominated, I wouldn't be surprised if I see my myself clicking on Sally Hawkins' name as well. You know. It's really amazing. I, you know what I you know what I wish was nominated is uh, Doug Jones in that film, or maybe even um, Andy Serkis in War for the Planet of the Apes. That those guys are out of because uh, that they're out of it because they're all prosthetic up or balls makes they, no they balls all over their face. Yeah, but green screen. Balls. I don't know why that's much different than the prosthetics that Gary Oldman went through in as Churchill. They're still very beautiful performances, especially Andy Serkis. I think War. it's only because people's concept. As opposed, and their understanding, their lack of understanding of right. what, how much of that is actually. A yeah, eventually that's going to have to go away. It's like the Netflix movies, also you know, Amazon movies. They get no love either because they're still confused by what they are exactly. Manchester by the Sea. Manchester by the Sea. Yeah, won won two Academy Awards, I think. But it was an Amazon studio. Yeah. Movie. Yeah. Um, I asked Jamie for uh, a list of puns. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I'm reminding her now. Uh, every year we go, we attend an Academy Award screening party where she comes up with food puns of dishes right. that she makes. Okay. Um, Jello high water, for example. Oh, that's funny. Uh-huh. Um, so I've asked her to send me a couple because I don't want to try to remember. I'll bastardize them. So Dun let's move on. Dun cake. To, yep. Dunkake, the see, it's a fun see. thing to do. Yeah, what uh, best picture, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's. What well, I guess I guess this goes to if my theory holds, the shape of water, um, it'll probably go to Lady Bird. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think, to me, that to me is the most um, character-driven, actor-driven movie of, uh, right, of of the year and emotionally connected very on, emotionally on a connected. level that's more human. Yeah. Forgive the right people word love play people, than shape of water. People love this movie. It's uncontroversial in its love. Mm -hmm. People just relate to it. Nobody, there's no backlash to, to it whatsoever. People say Dunkirk is, a, is, is an unemotional film, for example. Shape of Water is a fantasy, so it doesn't, it's not. Michael every, Shannon. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Michael Shape Shannon. Shape of Water, you think he'll get the nod? No, no. But, he's, but he deserves to. Yeah. He's a, he's a really awesome actor. One of the most compelling. I loved him in uh, Nocturnal Animals. Yeah, I of thought course. he was just of course. brilliant in that film yeah, he's, he's one of my favorite he's one of my favorite actors um, so you're going to say Lady Bird for the reason of the director the se split, separating yeah. Uh, yeah. The split yeah I'm pretty certain that there will be a split the only possibility is if Shape of Water wins Best Picture which I'm I'm not buying yet I mean I would be very happy to see it win it's a, it's a really high quality film but I don't think I think the last fantasy that won, and the only other fantasy to have won, was the um, Lord of the Rings, the King, the Return of the King. I think it was the only one that ever won the the Academy Award for Best Picture. That was that was in the fantasy genre. Yeah, but you know, you know, there there is something as you're predicting the Academy Awards. This uh, the thousand or so new members that were put in in one swoop, right? That has tremendously affected how people vote. You know, because I don't think the, most people know about what you're talking. Well, the Academy, in in reaction to the um, the Oscar so white complaint, um, admitted uh, a lot of people that are a lot of people people of color and a lot of women, but mostly the common denominator is their age. They're under forty, and I think that um, that affects the, the now, thinking the most. My understanding always was you had to be sort of. Uh, 
uh, supported or grandfathered in by two existing right. members. Right. Right. Yeah. You're saying that was true of these. Of this. I that I don't I don't know how that how that how went the down. thousand were added. I don't know, but right. I I don't know, and um, cut to the street corner where well, someone's got. Uh, uh, we'll cut to Moonlight when Paperwork uh, Excuse me, to, sir Would you mind joining The Academy yeah. <laughs> of Arts and Sciences? Okay, it cut to uh, Moonlight Winning Best Picture Right Which uh, incredibly well well deserved But not a chance Of what it won With You know, I I was at Arts Deli which, Well, now uh, you're just bragging I'm sorry I'm, I'm not Arts Deli in, uh, It's close to my house In Studio City A classic place For old timers to go Sure Old time writers And this was a couple Of years ago And um and there are a bunch of um, really old people, including a, one man that was very famous. I won't say who he was. And I went up to him and I introduced myself and, and you know, they're, you know, a bunch of old Jews. And they said, uh, I asked them, have you seen Straight Outta Compton? Because I thought it was a really great film. And they're all Academy members and none of them had even bothered to watch it. And that's the real issue. They'll watch civil rights movies. Mm -hmm which is great, like 12 Years of Slaves or right. In the Heat of the Night, going, going even further back. But movies that exist within the world of uh, African-American culture, they don't care about. I mean, they're not racist. They just don't – it's not their cup of tea. Mm -hmm. They don't want to watch a movie about the making of a song called Fuck the Police. It's not their thing. So if you can't watch the film, you're not going to vote for it. Although I predict uh, – not predict I, I assume that had they watched it and watched it through, they might have voted for it because right. it's a really great film. Um, now you have these thousand people coming in who all would watch that movie. And so now it, it, the, the problem with the Academy I don't think was its whiteness. I think it was its age hmm. and what people were willing or not willing to watch. So Moonlight, which is African-American centric, there's not one white character with a speaking line except a, one guy who was buying drugs. Um, and it's a very obviously very gay centric. You know, these are – this is not – the thing that those guys at Arts Deli watch. But now we have people that are watching them, which is great, which opens the floodgates of what they'll see. So everything that I'm saying and all my prognostications may theoretically go out, go out the window now because it's a, it's a whole new rules game. And I think it's more difficult to predict now. Mm. Well, that's a great perspective. Yeah. And a current one. Yes. Um, so does it feel like over an hour has gone by? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Does it feel like two hours has gone by? No, No, it does. It's, it feels like three hours already. Kevin, when does this it's end? great. Nothing can be, feel longer than watching you do five takes of a long speech in my movie. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, it was your first feature film deterrence yeah. as yes. a writer-director. Right. Now, you mentioned Terms of Endearment. Mm -hmm. Jim Brooks... Uh, who is a former guest of this show. And, is that right? Yeah, and someone I mention often because he is yeah. semi-regular at my weekly poker game. Um, Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. Um, he uh, Has there ever been a better written screenplay? Maybe broadcast news. Do you know he is uh, the only first-time direct writer-director, the only in yeah. history, whose first time as a writer-director won Best Screenplay, Best Director, and Best Picture. Never happened before or since. I did in terms not. Terms of endearment. As I, a first timer, screenplay director, picture. No, I know there have been a couple of directors who have won for their first movie, but like um, um, Sam Mendes, but I mm -hmm. did not know that. Isn't that crazy? Well, it is. I mean, he had this long life in television prior. And he managed to get three of, at the time, three of the hottest, best actors in the world into that exquisite. Movie. It has one of my, my one of my great favorite moments when uh, um, he's Jack Nicholson is leaving for the airport and and she and, and sh they say their goodbyes. She and Shirley MacLaine and then I say it he all the leaves time. and I say this all the and time what to is, myself in my and what, life. And what is a, and close to a clean getaway? Oh my god! It was so great. Yeah. I lo fucking love that line so much. And it's a beautiful. Yes. Uh, oh, it's sentiment great. and so well executed. Yeah. Um, so as a first-time writer-director, mm -hmm. there is um, – there's all the um, a pride and excitement and, a, a, and surprise of having made it to the set. Right. All, all the machinations that had to take place yes. first mm -hmm. right. to finally get there. Right. And uh, 
One of which, as my memory goes, mm. that I will now test, is one night at a poker table, um, you said to me, oh, I think away from the table over by the food, hey, listen, right. I'm writing this script and I'm on page 40 and I yes. realize that I'm kind of writing it with you in mind. I'm kind right. of thinking, am I correct that that's the memory? I, I didn't say I kind of realized. I said I'm writing it with you in mind. Right. And I said, mm -hmm. do you, I don't know if you remember, but I, my memory of what I said was, so you want no one to see this? Yeah. But, the, you know, I, I'll tell you how we came to that point, which I don't know if I ever told you this story, which is that I was desperate to get a movie made. And I, right. and I began to understand through failing to get two other films made, I uh, gotten close, but not quite there, was it was all, it was all um, foreign sales driven. As yeah. you said before, you know, what actor can, can sell a movie? Well, I think that you had been in The Usual Suspects, which was- And A Few uh, Good Men. And A Few Good Men. But the usual suspects was the was the more recent film, and it had garnered a lot of a, a lot of a, a tremendous amount of attention and Kevin overseas. Had, it only overseas. made twenty two million here; yeah, it made a hundred million in Europe. Right. Alone. It, but that's the point: yeah. is we only care about Europe and, and Asia to, to a certain degree because that's where the overseas sales are. And um, my my short film had won um, uh, the award for best film at the Deville Film Festival, best right. short film. And there was a television company that had sponsored it. So I went to the guy who ran there and I said, listen, I play poker with Kevin Pollack. <laughs> and he goes, oh, I like Kevin Pollack. And I said, I need you to tell me if I can get Kevin to star in a film, how much money you would put into that film. And he said $1.2 million. He said $800,000. <laughs> he said $800,000. Right. right. Is what he, and this, I'm telling you a, a, a true story. Yeah. What year was this? 96, 95? We were, the, the, this conversation was had in 97. 97. Okay. Or maybe early 90, no, 1998. And so what I, you know, so this was all calculation on my part. Sure. I used you like a, like a chess piece. Sure. Because what I figured was, I now have to write a movie that can be made for $800,000, meaning probably one set, mm -hmm. and... It's something that you could not say no to. Right. So then I had to figure, if it, if it was well written, what role is Kevin would Kevin Pollack never be fucking offered in a million years? The first Jewish president. A drama, first as a, a drama as the president of the United States, and, and and then I had to credibly make you the president of the United States. Well, you mentioned a drama, but at that point, my my uh, fantastic plan of being the next Michael Keaton, specifically from Night Shift, right, a, a star in comedy right. films. Yeah, uh, had been completely derailed. Right, and you had been in dramas by a few good men, right. Usual Suspects, and, and Casino. casino yeah. Right. So, but nevertheless, and no one saying you should be. But, a lead but you're in the offered film. leading roles is not going to be in a drama. Right. Right? My, that was my assessment anyway. So I said, I'm making the president of the United States, and I know Kevin. He's got an ego. He'll be the president of the United States. So this was designed before you had put pen to paper, or in this case, fingers to keyboard. You didn't even have a concept yet no. until you realized yes. I had to be in it. Yes. And what role could I not say no to? Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> I never heard this. Yeah, that is that that is exactly that is exactly correct. And it was because I was the only somewhat recognizable actor that you had uh, that I had a, that I a had first hand relationship with. First hand relationship, or just a modicum of respect well, for. No, I had a lot of respect <laughs> for you, but and you were a really good poker player, but. Um, but then, but then, I gave you those forty-eight pages, and and, and you read them, and you said, "Keep going," and so I was I, I was astonished. Yeah, so I so I kept going, and um, and you said yes, and then, and then I gave it to them, and then they said what they always say every single time. Okay, who else? Who else? And I'm like, are you kidding me? And they go, no, who else? Now, they, w they would have made the movie even if we hadn't gotten Tim Hutton. Sure. But, you know, Tim, w they wanted a bit of an insurance policy right. for, for whatever reason. And, and Tim Tim's said, great, and we were lucky to get him. Yeah, Tim was great, and we were lucky to get him. And we put Sean Astin in, who was a tiny bit of a name, and, and Shirley Ralph. And, and so it was a— And that French actress who was— uh, uh, That's the other thing, Clotilde yeah. Quarot, um, uh, who— uh, um, was not a huge star in France, but a, enough of a name that it helped them. Um, that it helped them sell the movie in France. Sure. So now we've got like hundred thousand coming from France, and we just had to cobble enough of the pre-sales to right. come up with eight hundred, which they were confident they could do, and they 
and they did do. And so that's how it how, that's how all that came to pass. I have only one framed photograph uh -huh. large hanging in my home from I have a few smaller ones on the mantle. Yeah. But I have only one large frame photo. It's you, me, Tim Hutton and Sean Aston playing poker. Oh yeah, we're all looking up at the camera. Yeah. That's right. Well, that, uh, that's just offset. That's the only poker game that I played in because there was a running poker game. Yeah. There and drop. I, I saw Sean Aston at the right. Critics Choice Awards and he said the words drop. That was the game. Well, we were I remember playing. I forgot that game. Three, two, yeah. one, drop. I don't even right. remember the fucking I don't know rules. how it's played. <laughs> but the but yeah. um Yeah, that but one you, hand was the only hand you played. But you guys you guys We would rush off the set. Rush off the set to and go we were play. on a sound stage, we should right. tell people. And that beautiful uh uh job of yours was um uh, you you had uh, the president on the campaign trail to right. be elected for the first time. He was a right. vice president who took over after the president right. passed away. Um, and he was on the campaign trail, and he yeah. snowed in the small diner. In Colorado. In Colorado Springs, I believe. Outside of Colorado Springs, yeah. right. Yeah. The most conservative town in Colorado. Yeah. Um, and that was a part of the design as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he has to ultimately decide whether or not to wage a World War III. Deterrence. It's not easy to find. I hear from people all the time, yeah, and I don't I, know what that means. It's – it's uh, you can get it at Amazon. You and, can find it. You know, um, but I, let me do a little deterrence trivia with you. Please. Who was your opponent in the race for the presidency? It's mentioned once. You see it on – Don't say Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. Donald Trump. Don't say Donald Trump. It, Donald Trump. Got it right. I anticipated – we anticipated more problems. Remember, this is 98, right? So we anticipated – before he's even a reality star. Before he's even a reality star. He's just star, a star I, in I, reality. I absolutely assumed he would one day run run for the presidency and I'm so sickened by that. You based that on It's a Wonderful Life and him being Mr. Potter. Something like that. It was a yeah. – but I – you know, and we also looked at the, black, the female black national security advisor, which – you know, we sort of saw coming, and the and the renewed troubles with uh, with Iraq and and the North Korean Peninsula. Yeah, it was. You know, I'm happy to say it was a very. A lot of people, when the reviews came out, you know, criticized it from from a political point of view as being unrealistic. But it turns out it was really. Turns out it was really really realistic. Yeah. Yeah. It was a. It was a that movie was very probably my most difficult movie to make because I was I had no experience right. whatsoever. I had I had 18 days to. Uh, 18 days to shoot it and um, full of, um, you know, attacks on my confidence throughout making that film and um, – uh, There's a bit of mind fucking and undermining going on. Yeah, I would so. Let's, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, but you, you know go, – go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. You know, it, it, was, it was interesting because that movie took a lot of room in the – a lot of time in the editing room to, to fix – and uh, to make – because it ended up being a rather well-reviewed film. Some people took some shot, shots at it. But uh, Stephen Holden, uh, New York Times, will give well, me the worst review I think I'll ever get in my entire life. <laughs> in mine too. Yeah. And it's, but, I mean he really went out of his way. Yeah, he must have had a thing for one of us or both of us. It would be me. Yeah, because it because, was yeah. astonishing yeah. how he went out of right. his way. And then, but then he gave an amazing review to my next film. Of The Contender. Right. right. But – but the other reviews were really like Roger Ebert gave us a great review. And, yeah. that, that and George Magazine, I remember, gave us. Everybody, it was yeah. more or less a really well, really well reviewed film. Um, but the, yeah, well, the New York Times review was the first review that I read, and it was wow that talk. And, and I was editing the Contender when that when that review came out. But you know, if we're being honest, sure. when when I showed you the film for the first time, you were freaked out. You came to me and you gave me a line that I've used over and over again. You were like, you said to me, Rod, with this cut, you're going to get prison raped. You said that to me. And um, I meant by critics? Yeah. Uh -huh. And then the, the next day, you, you know, your contract called you for you to be, you and your ex-wife called for you to be a producer on the film and you wanted your names taken off as producers. And, you know, that was... Um, I don't want to say it was hurtful. I'm a big boy, you know. I'm a, I'm a military guy. I'm a West Point graduate. But it made me, like, sit back and say, okay, if they're this unnerved, you know, and they're thinking this may be career, uh, career hurtful to them, there must be something really wrong with the film. And so, you know, 
that that caused uh, a new round of editing for me. And we got it to a place where Stephen Holden, notwithstanding, it turned out to be a, a very good film. And one that got all those actors into into the, every one of those actors in the contender, the three best actors in the world in my mind at the time, all agreed to do my film because of deterrence and more specifically by your performance in in deterrence did those horrifically her historically hurtful words cause enough of an editing change do you feel that yes, made I, yeah, the difference yeah, I, absolutely. between absolutely well listen was it a I, first cut couldn't have been a first it cut was, it was the, it was the first cut cuz there's no director first of all every time i hear someone's about to direct a movie yeah. or did direct a movie yeah. that's a friend of mine that i yeah. can reach out to yeah i ask them how they survived the first cut because yeah. it's it's so debilitating. Well, it's a, you know, there's two first cuts. One is a first cut that your editor shows you, and then there's a first well, cut. Well, that you don't let anyone see. Nobody. Because <laughs> then you want to turn in your DGA card. Right. But, the, the, but, I, but I learned my lesson from that. I did show you a first cut and learned my lesson to, 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 never, to never do that again, right. not to show the talent the, the first cut. God, no. You know, it's really interesting. When you're watching a movie – now, that was in a screening room. But when you're watching a movie – with an audience, be it in the editing room or in a screening room, you become the audience. Right. Like when I, I did a movie called Straw Dogs a few years ago, uh, the remake of Straw Dogs, and I showed it to my actors individually in the editing room with them, James Marsden, Kate Bosworth, and Alexander Skarsgård. And when I'm watching the movie with them, I'm saying, oh my God, they're not on screen now. Why, why are they saying these lines and they're not on screen? And that's what they're thinking is that, you know, why am I, why is the camera not on me right now? And mm -hmm. I'm watching it through their eyes. Or were you watching with an audience? If you sense they're being bored, it just kills you. Yeah. It drains you. Sure. Right? And, um, you know, and, and as I was watching Deterrence and you and, uh, and Lucy were there, it was, um, you know, I realized that, that the film, that the film, that the film wasn't, wasn't there yet, and it, it was it was too it was too long. It was um, it was not edited crisply. Um, well, those I, were the standout issues, yeah. and th those are the things that undermine always the potentness of any story, especially a thriller. Especially, right. so I, I yeah. saw the film. You know, again, there was a screening of the film um, a couple months ago. A couple months ago, and that I went to, and you know. Um, there are a couple of things I would do differently, especially story-wise and very much music-wise. I made a couple of – music is great, but I made a couple of cute, bad cue decisions in that movie. Well, you've learned so much since. Yeah, but it's – a lot of it is really good. And the performances, and the overlapping dialogue, it's, uh, it's, it's really realistic. The biggest music cue I made, mistake I made in that film, and this would only mean anything to anybody who's seen the film, which all of you should see – yeah, is that there is a speech that you give at the end after having done something pretty amazing and, and pretty horrific in the film where, you know, I'm not trying to make Walter Emerson, your character, a hero. You know, I'm trying to make a movie that says anybody can become a fascist given the right set of circumstances. But the music cue I put on, under there was somewhat heroic. So you're saying, when you're saying no one's going to fuck with the United States, it... It comes across like a Rocky right. as opposed to some sort of um, uh, dystopian forewarning, right. in which was what I had hoped that, that – It undermines. It, it did undermine. The exact yeah. point you were trying to make. Yeah. Um, and on that note, I'm going to give you now the names of uh, Oscar night dinner party okay. pun-driven okay. dishes. Good. Uh, I'm going Begin. to list all of them, and then I'm going to ask you for your favorite. All right. La La Lamb. <laughs> that's funny. These are all from Jamie Foxx. He gets all the credit. That's Jamie Foxx? Yeah, well, that's her name. And by the way, his real name is Eric Bishop, just so you know. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, my Jamie Foxx is not the one with the Academy Award. Uh, Jello High So Wong. her phone will be Jamie Foxy. That's right. Okay. Ham Chester by the Pea Soup. <laughs> Bridge of Pies. Okay, not bad. The Big Short Ribs, Steve Cobbs, <laughs> Mad Mac and Cheese, and uh, the last three, by the way, went on the went on the plate out of Compton. Mad uh, Mac and Cheese is pretty funny. <laughs> you laughed the hardest though at uh, Ham Hamchester by the yeah, that soup. was that. That's very funny. <laughs> yeah, the, the, that's very funny. But it's, it's a bit of a mouthful. You sure it is. Yeah, yeah. But Mad Mac. <laughs> <laughs> was, that was pretty funny. Um, we're just about out of time, so oh, it's no. time to play 
Uh, ask Kevin. That's the first uh, first of two. Yeah. Ask Kevin? Ask Kevin. So this is where you're allowed to ask me any single question. It could be silly, sincere, or neither. When did you lose and how did you lose your virginity? I was a senior in high school. Uh-huh. And I was um, dating a girl who I tried to date in kindergarten and mm-hmm. failed. Right. And all these in years later in kindergarten, all these years later, the senior year, so that would be the full circle, uh, we were dating and she was um, – just world lengths ahead of me in maturity in every possible way. We spoke about how right. women mature so much sooner. Um, but it was in my house that I was raised in, in my bedroom, uh, in the middle of the day. Right. Um, and, and it was going to happen. And you know right. of all that means. And in the middle of it, uh-huh. I heard the distinct sound of the front door opening all the way oh, from no. my bedroom. And the front door opening meant only one thing, and that it was mom was, was home, home, and she had come home early for no fucking reason. Right. And I was able to um, dismount and get my hand on the doorknob of right. my bedroom at seconds before my mom did not knock, which she always had prior, but had grabbed the doorknob to enter my room. And First of all, my door was never closed. Right. So she, I guess, assumed that I had been. And the, and the young lady was naked? The, well, the, I, like I said, I dismounted. Yeah. We were halfway through right. my losing my virginity when I had to dismount and put my hand on the knob to stop my mother oh my from God. entering the room and yelling, uh, in here. Oh, my God. Yeah. So she knew what was going on. She, uh, okay, and walked away. And then here's the question for you now. A, did I return to reach completion? Right. B, did I say we should probably get dressed? No, you returned. Because you, the, the reason why I'm saying that is because I asked you how you lost your virginity. Right. So that, how you have, that has to have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good Much story. to the shock and amazement to um, my girlfriend at the time. Good story. Uh, we we uh, we returned and, and with my mother in the house. Right. I had to finish. Right. I had oh, to. Oh my God. There's no that story can't end with, and then I didn't. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so now you have to play the uh, pop quiz between 5 and 15 points possible for each of the three questions. Once the final score is tabulated, it will be yeah. posted on our website along with the current standing of the t- among the top 100. Are you ready? Uh, sure. <laughs> Question one, Sammy Davis Jr. or Ann B. Davis? Ann B. Davis. That's correct. Question two, Carl Weathers or the weather in Carlsbad? Well, that's Carl Weathers. Of course. And last question, Keith? Keith Gordon. <laughs> we got all three. Yeah, very good. <laughs> three for three. Very Keith, impressive. Keith, Keith Gordon did such a great job uh, in uh, the last couple of episodes of Fargo. Oh, that Fargo, he, that he yeah. Directed. He is, he's a wonderful director. Now, you began off, I want to tell you something. Yes, sir. I, it, it, the guy was talking about Alan Alda. Uh-huh. Right. He got his number for you. Okay, good. Yes, you did. I'll give you his email. You're going to uh, share both. I mean, we we work together and we're friendly and I've I've seen him and and I've dined with him in New York with a few other people. Alan has become one of my closest friends in life. Oh, wow. I directed him twice. Right. The first time that I directed him was in a movie called Resurrecting the Champ. And I remember when we said goodbye to him as the director said goodbye to actors, I said, I can't believe that I get to say that I directed Alan Alda, who I truly think is one of the best actors there is. That ever lived. Period. Yeah. The second time I directed him was in um, my best movie called Nothing But the Truth. And I, when he left, I said, I can't believe I got to say that Alan Alda is my friend. And the guy is such a mensch, and he's such a good husband, and his wife is such a good wife, his wife, Arlene. When I got engaged to my second wife, Kira, Kira Davis, she is a novelist, a New York Times bestselling novelist. Read the book Just One Night. Um, That day, I asked Alan if Kira and I could have dinner with him and Arlene because I thought it would be good luck because they're such a fantastic couple. And have been married... For literally forever, and it's the only it's 50, 60 years, I think. At this I think point. 60, maybe. And, and he's never been with another woman, and I don't think she's been with another man. And I think that it's just the most exquisite relationship. But god damn, is he a good actor! You know, he's very funny, but he's um, he's exceptional, he's exceptional. crimes and misdemeanors. 
Oh no, it's it's endless. You could we could spend yeah. the next hour just talking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. He's work. and and I'll bet you he, I you know. I don't know if he'd come here. Is he in New York? Or he's, or is in, he he, out in he's, a, he's in New York. I thought he was. Yeah, New York, and he's got a great place on on Long Island. And yeah. Well, when I go back to work on his, um, Marvelous his, Mrs. Maisel, we shoot in New York, and I'm going to be doing some shows from there. So his yeah his uh, his grandson dog sits for me. Oh my! It's just the it's just it's just the the, the greatest. But oh. to me, Alan Alda is one of the best actors of of all time, and. Um, you know, I'm creating a new TV series, and um, I'm hoping that he's going to be he's going to be in it. Because, by the way, I I gave him the worst piece of direction that I've ever given an actor in really? my life, and he and he told me that. I learn a lot from my actors when they, you know, when they tell me how when I they fucked send up. you back to the editing. Bench. Well, there was a scene in there's a scene in Nothing But the Truth where he's visiting a. Uh, a a woman who has gotten beaten up in jail because of his inefficiency. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, and I need you to cry. And he goes, okay. And he doesn't cry. And he said, I just couldn't cry. And then he said, you know what? Next time, tell me why. Yeah. And maybe I will. Right. But, you know, we're not trained SEALs. We don't just do that stuff. And... You know, he he was he was. You have absolute, to articulate the emotion you actually want to. Create. You know, you never stop. I, I can say that you never stop learning as a director, unless you're Steven Spielberg. You just, you just never, never stop. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I I I hate the casting process in terms of auditioning. So I just called up actors that I thought were brilliant and knew would do a great job. And then once I had them on the set, the the. Most of the direction I would give would walk up to them and would just whisper in their ear, I need about 17% less and walk away. Because the truth right. of the matter is um, you, you know they're going to kill it for you before they well, step up to the right. plate. But if you need a specific piece of emotion. Right. You have to tell them why. You have I've to I've got tell so them. many examples of that. But, I, but I'll tell you, you once told me something. You know, I, when you were in – when you did Casino – um, I asked you, is there anything, I, w- I wonder if you remember this, that Scorsese said to you that I can learn from? Any piece of advice he gave you as an actor? Do you remember what you said to me? Do you happen to remember the anecdote you gave me? Well, the story I always tell about yeah. the example that I have, the best yeah. example I have, is when uh, De Niro and I are at the table and it turns into the how many blueberries do you right. have in your muffin? Yes. And the way Scorsese and De Niro work is that they'll do 25 to 35 takes. Right. And De Niro gets to try something yes. different in every single take. Right. And Marty can't get enough. Right. Now, you've got Bob Richardson, the cinematographer, who will light until you shoot him in the head. Right. Maybe three hours for every setup. Right. It's astonishing. Yeah. And within the composition of the shot, if you were to put a graph of squares over the monitor, right. Scorsese knows what he wants in every single box of that graph of, right. of the monitor. Right. The composition is so specific. Right. But then within that composition or sandbox, the actors get to literally do whatever they want. Right. And so after every take, he would come over and there'd be a little bobbing Scorsese head right. at, the edge yes. of the, at the edge of the table and full of energy and excitement. Yeah. And he would say, so what do you think? You should be more angry, less? What do you? And, and sometimes directors will ask that question right. knowing which one of those they want. Right. But they'll let the actor decide. Right. Knowing that after the next take, they can come back and get the one they really want. Right. So they play a little bit of a game, which it's is not bad. It's a bit of a kabuki game, yeah. It's not bad because actors do want to feel like they're part of the process. Right. But when Scorsese's little bobbing head came to the edge of the table saying, what do you think, more or less? He really wanted to know what I thought. Right. That was the astonishing part, that a guy that right. was so specific about his composition right. gave the actors complete freedom. Right. Um, and then just supported it and tried right. a bunch of different and, things. And you, but you told me something else sure. uh, slightly uh, different, which is what do you think – Would you? how would you do it differently? Right. And you said – that's what you told me. And He in, said to me, how would you do it differently? And you said – Maybe I do it a little less, and then he would pat you on the shoulder and said, "Let's try that." Right, right. And I do that all the time now. How would you do that differently? How would you, would you like to try it differently? How would you do it differently? Not, do you want to do it differently? How would you do it differently? Right. You don't give them the option of saying, "I oh, don't. I'm not going to do it differently." <laughs> and they will give you some answer, and you say, "Let's try that." And you're right. After that, say, "You know what? Let's try it the other way now." Right. You know, and you know, and that, and that sure. you're fully. If you have the time. Yeah. Then that sort of experimentation. Now, I'm an actor that that was not trained, other than right. other than on the set and in the right. feet of greatness. 
um, I hated school so much, the idea of going to an acting class seemed mm-hmm. uh, the opposite of what I wanted to experience. And also, where did you go to school? Subconsciously, I felt like I might be rejected yeah. in acting school, and I yeah. and I didn't, I wasn't ready yeah. for that. Um, college, where did yeah. I go? Yeah, I went to the uh, proud <laughs> state university, uh, known as San Jose State University, where I graduated in nine months. Now, my right. friends call it dropping out, but to me, I felt <laughs> yeah, like exactly. I really accomplished all I needed to in school. I like their football team. Yeah, no, they they got to a, a bowl game a couple yeah, years ago where right. my nephew Jason was uh, the assistant coach to uh, wide receivers. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, um, or might have been defensive backs. Hope I didn't fuck that up. But uh, yeah, so um, I I feel like if you if you can make the actors feel as though they're involved in the right. process, but my problem is. I'm bored after three or four takes, and I just hear myself acting. Right. So I need a little inspiration from the director. Right. So a question like, if you were to do it again, how would how would you want to right. do it differently? That's right. I think um, it's the, that. I'm glad you reminded me of that specific phrasing. Yeah, that's really and 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 I've used that often, and it's and it's often succeeded. And yeah. And I, and I know we're out of time, but I, but I'll tell you something else, Kevin, which is that sometimes I'll do due diligence on an actor and often it's not good there was one um there was one female actor with whom i worked where the due diligence was horrible one director said to me described his experience with her as being traumatic and i started to examine the films that she has made and the directors that complained about her, and I saw that she's a highly intelligent woman, and she's not in highly intelligent films, and she's frustrated. And I realized that the way to to work with her is to uh, involve her intellectually in the process. Mm. And I had the most amazing relationship uh, with her, and she gave, I think, a performance of, uh, of, of, her, of her career. And, you know, the, the truth is that Many actors are like incredibly inte- not all of them, but many of them are incredibly intelligent, and they're not, um, as Hitchcock would say, cattle. And that to, you know, to engage them in the in the in the process is is really important. The worst thing to do is to tell them what to do. The best thing to do is to tell them what you want. Yeah, and there's a difference. Sure. And um, you know, I'm 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 st- I'm still learning that. And uh, you that's know, a great uh, yeah point, though, in terms of. The vast, the chasm between those two lines. There's so much we didn't talk about. But you know what that means. We'll come back one day. You'll have to come back. All right. And uh, you thought, when, you when, thought, when is this going to drop? When, when, when will, will this air before or after the Super Bowl? Not air. When will we put up? It will drop before the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. So you want to make your prediction? Minnesota Patriots. Uh-huh. Vikings Patriots, I, I would, I'm would, i going to guess. But I, I think that's the only Super Bowl that's going to get anybody watching, mm-hmm. you know. Take the over in the New England game, by the way. I've already done it. Yeah. I've already done it. It's uh, literally, I've already done it for like a lot. I think that. That I came out of retirement. I told you off air that I had stopped uh, betting on football. So here's the reason why. Yeah. Um, I bet on the NFL my whole life. Right. Uh, I remember. Yeah. And about five years ago. I got very frustrated by any one particular team able to do what they're supposed to do consistently. Right. Week after week. Right. Which is to beat the spread. Not just win the game. You got to beat the spread. You got to beat the spread. Yeah. And so I found that I was betting on too many favorites because I believe they were supposed to do what they were supposed to do. Right. And I realized that I had fallen into that trap. And my other problem was that I was betting too many games instead of just picking a couple of and highly – Yeah, that's my my flaw too. Right. So then I decided – all right, I'm going to try an experiment. And the season was about to begin. And I'm going to lean into my two problems of betting too many games and always taking the favorite. Right. So I'm going to bet every single game right. of every week, the exact amount on every game, mm-hmm. not fluctuate with opinion, exact right. amount. Right, smart. And I'm going to take the underdog in every single game. Mm-hmm. No matter what, Yeah. I bet every game, yeah. and I took the dog. So you lost a little bit of money. 68% victory really? at the end of the season. Yes, really. The very next year, I said, I got to try it again. I was 64% the very next year. Really? Yes. And then I quit because I realized a monkey could have done this. I wasn't involved at all the entire season. Mm-hmm. I didn't make one decision. I didn't do any research. I didn't care right. about any single yeah, interesting. game because I, my my situation was locked in. Right. 
the and so even though I was victorious for the first time ever, by there's the way, no fun. You talk to an NFL, someone who bets the NFL; yeah. they do not finish the year in the plus unless they make giant bets during the playoffs right. in the Super Bowl. J- that's that's where I make my money. <laughs> James Con right. told me that the reason that he bets on football is he likes to be right. Yeah. And so what you're saying is you're not right, you're not wrong, you're just. He's like playing Baccarat. Well, uh, weirdly, I was right more often than I was wrong when I took the dog in every single well, what game. I'm saying is uh, that's not a decision But anymore. I wasn't involved. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, I— He know, bets the NFL because he likes to be right? He's a lunatic. That's what he said. You know, uh, the, the game that was just played, the Saints versus the Vikings, with that Shh. unbelievable ending. Yeah. Well, I had the Saints plus five and a half. Of course you did. So the— they, when the you Vikings know, score on that miracle touchdown, they're up by five. I'm still winning. And then, remember, they couldn't get everyone off the field to kick the extra point. And I'm saying, don't kick the extra also, point. Also, time had run out. Time had run out. But but uh, by rule, they got to kick the extra point. And I'm just hoping that they're mentors and take a knee. Yeah. Because if they take a knee, I win my bet. If they kick the extra point, I lose my bet. I can only imagine what was going on in but Vegas. You had, but you had to have known they were going to take a knee because you have to make sure that there's no possible outcome that could change the score. Right. But – Still, but I've I've seen it go both ways. Where they because the, what happened was that the Saints weren't even there right. initially, and at that point, what Case Keenum, the quarterback, would have done was for the fun of it, padded his stats and run in for um, sure. the two point conversion. Sure, right. But when the Saints did come out and they shook hands, I said, "Ah, we'll take a knee." But I guarantee you, in Vegas, oh, they lost you know, their sports minds. books, they were losing their minds because no one knew if they'd won or lost. And their, their bet. genius is to get equal money on both sides That's and what just they want. take the vig. That's right. their genius of setting the line. Yeah. If when that can happen, then then they're then they're golden. Yeah. If I, I also started to learn if you could figure out where America is leaning. Yeah. Go, go the, the other way. Go yeah, the other of way. course. Well, it's they're now, astonishing. They're, they're now sites that will tell you where the where the money is and where the sharp money is and and where it's not. You know, I, I don't play table games at casinos anymore, but I do bet on football. I just enjoy it so much more when that happens. And right. Like, oh my God, last year's Super Bowl, I was in the high roller room and there was a guy with me who had bet a million point two on Atlanta Falcons and he is struggling. First like, half, he's never been so oh happy. Oh my God. And even, and even when they go to overtime, right. the, the, the Patriots are favored by like five and they just – and he knows that Field goal. likely if they do win, they'll win by three. And then they win by a touchdown. And oh, my God. And I won everything at that point. Sure. You know? Anyway, we can talk about football betting forever because this is – Well, I'm glad we scores it in. All right. Yeah. And thank you very much. Uh, sit there and comfortably. I'll wrap things up for the folks at home. Thanks. Sure. Once again to our guest, Rod Lurie, uh, award-winning filmmaker. Check out his body of work the next moment you get because 76% of it is spectacular. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. Uh, let's see. Upcoming guests, as I mentioned, Louis Anderson and Pamela Adlon. Follow uh, myself on Twitter to get more information about upcoming shows, either at, uh, at KP Chat Show or at Kevin Pollack. And um, – you're on the Twitter. At Rod Lurie. There you R-O-D go. R-O-D as in dog and then L-U-R-I-E. All right. Until next time, man. Oh, thanks very much to Sam, our engineer, and all the fine folks here at Airwolf and uh, Corey Levin in post. Uh, until next time, man, as always, get out of my face. <laughs>